Welcome, welcome everybody to our very first, we're making history here today, annual Ocean Life Symposium to inspire action for the health of our oceans. I want to thank you very much for coming here today on a Saturday. You're going to spend the day with us hearing some phenomenal information. I think that uh, there's a lot going on, as we know, in the world today. And if, and if this gets to be TMI, I offer that you remember we're all here together, listening, witnessing, learning the language, hearing from experts who have been doing this work as observers and protectors of the oceans and scientists of the oceans for decades. We are really fortunate to have some of the top world-renowned scientists with us today, ocean scientists. And uh, you get to hear from all of them today. Um, so who are we? The Ocean Life Symposium came out of the idea from uh, having stood at the public hearing with the Navy. There was a big EIR, Naval Weapons Testing, Maybe some of you were there. It was very disturbing the way that was presented and none of us really had a chance to stand up and speak. And so instead of galvanizing our community, it separated us. And a lot of people left there feeling very angry and disappointed. So several of us got together and said, what can we do? And we know that Fear and separation is being uh, put out there in our country right now, in the world today. So we thought, how can we bring people together? How can we witness what's going on together and find solutions in the midst of all of these challenges and the pain of the world? So we know that knowing about something is the key to caring. And taking positive action can be difficult if you're doing it alone. So we are hoping that with the information you hear today and with the conversation and the dialogue, that you will feel a sense of hope, that there are some pathways to go down in which we can take action together here. So for those of you that do not know, there is a plan for the Navy to be testing weapons 12 miles off our coast here. It's, and we'll hear more about that as well today. But what we're talking about are 20,000 tons of toxins going into the ocean. We're talking about underwater detonations. We're talking about the release of thousands of drones for military uh, purposes. We're talking about aircraft dropping bombs from the air into our oceans, just 12 miles off our coast. And I think for me, I've lived in Mendocino for over 20 years, it was always like, yeah, too bad that's happening down there. Bummer, that's going on over there. But now it's happening here. And we need to know that, and we need to wake up to that fact and turn towards each other and say, what can we do? So, um, our little group that got together did all this out of pocket, meeting at night at my kitchen table, and I'd like for people that are part of that group to stand up, please. We've got Scott Tree Mercer, Andy Wellspring, We have uh, Nicole Martinson that could not be with us here today from Surfrider and my daughter Tanaya who's currently getting her undergraduate degree in uh, wildlife ecology and conservation. She couldn't make it, she's got midterms, but she sends her best. Um, so we know that the ocean is a corner cornerstone of all life and it covers two thirds of our planet. It produces 50 to 85% of all of our oxygen. It has a lot to do with our climate. 
and balancing our climate out. And basically, the ocean is our security, our economy, and our very survival. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this huge body of water that is life itself. That's why we should all be concerned, and we should be thinking about what can we do, however big or small, however much time you can put in. Um, we also had Andy, who runs Sonar. Andy, you want to come on up? Thank you. Uh, his Sonar class has been very active in making sure this happens. So, Andy, you want to say a few words about that? Hi, thanks again for coming, everyone. Just first of all, um, I'm, my co-teacher is Laura Levitt. We run the Sonar program together. Um, but um, we have a lot of students here today. It's students from Reno High, like, can you raise your hand? Yeah. We've got, yeah, we have folks here from the KAKX uh, Mendocino High School radio program running some tech for us. We have Sonar students here um, going to be interviewing the scientists and presenters. We have um, the Interact Club is here selling some cool hats and bumper stickers um, outside like to support um, ocean. Um, issues like any money that you're able to donate today um, for food and whatnot. We're not asking prices for anything, but anything you can share with us is going to come back to the whole high school. We're inviting a speaker from Indigenous Environmental Network to come down and speak, uh, come down from the Hoopa Reservation, and where we got to go on a trip and was a very inspirational speaker. So the students decided they want to share that with the rest of the school. So any money you can leave with us will go to a really good um, cause. And, uh, and include, like, our class is three hours long. It's, it's an extra long class. We get to take a lot of field trips and go all around the area here and meet with environmental scientists and um, things like that. So, including working with the NOYO Center. Thanks for coming, Sue. And so, it's a really great program, and thank you all for supporting us and our mission here. Um, if you all need to use the bathrooms, there are two bathrooms outside. Go out the main door and turn left, and you'll see them. They're on this. They're attached to the same building. Um, I believe that's it for introduction. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. So I want to let you know the, the way this program is going to run today. We're going to hear, hear our presenters, the scientists I was talking about. Then we're going to have panel discussions between the scientists. We get to ask questions and hear what's going on and uh, get more information that way. We will have a lunch break um, tonight. Uh, thank you to the Noyo Center for Marine Science. They are going to be doing a meet and greet up there on Main Street in their building, and we get to then mingle with the scientists and hear more. Um, they'll be from six to eight this evening. Uh, I, last night, some of you might have been here, but I, you know, you might be sitting there and thinking, whoa, there's just too much going on, I can't handle it. I mean, what am I really gonna do? I'm gonna sit here and listen, but I, I love to share this quote, it sort of guides me through my life, I do a lot of, uh, social and environmental justice, that's what I do for a living. And um, some days I, I get up and I think, I don't know if I can do that again. But then I read this quote, and this is what carries me through, so I want to share it with you. It's from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the insurmountability of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. So with that said, I'm going to invite our Hawaiian sister, Ui, who lives here now on the coast, and she has offered to do a ceremony to link us with the ocean. And uh, Ui, come on up.
I know I'll tell you why we chose that name. Kula of the beautiful sea by Noyo. We wanted to use a name name and Noyo as a name for the area. So it's a common name for this area. So we are Kula of the beautiful sea by Noyo. Or Kula of Kekai Rani by Noyo. So I wanted them because in my Hawaiian culture, as an indigenous person, it's good to come with, with, with strength. And I find strength in these women that I dance with and these nakeki I dance with. And I think it's really important that if we're talking about something um, like the water, the land, um, it's important to kind of ground yourself of ancestors that come before you. Whatever walk of life you have come from, you come from ancestors somewhere that were attached to some kind of land and water source. And they all connect. And if we don't ground ourselves in who came before us, we forget on how important it is. So this chant that we're about to do is called Eho Mai. Eho Mai is a chant that kind of grants you, um, we say it up an octave, well, a level higher or octave higher each time to the best of our abilities. And um, it kind of brings us up another level of consciousness of receiving the gifts that are gonna come from the words or the sounds or the songs that you may hear during this ocean symposium. And as an indigenous person, I want to say I'm so thankful this is happening. Because it's happening all around the world. What's happening to our oceans is affecting the people. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to lose the people. We're going to lose our resources. And it's not OK. So this chant is a gift to you to give you mana, to give you strength, to receive all that you're going to hear today. Speaking to, 
And she said, sometimes you have to hum on. You have to quiet yourself. And sometimes you have to hold a little hand. You have to listen. And sometimes you don't use your words, you use your makas to look at what's happening to our ocean. Sometimes our senses work more and tell us more than we're ready to receive. But I think it's time. And she said, it starts with how. And then with your voice and your what you teach and everyone that is here to receive the message and can pass it on, you're going to give it to Ka'ua, other people. And together, Ka'ko, all of us, are going to create a change. And that change starts with yourself and the knowing, the being quiet and listening, using your makas to see. And then you use your wa'a to speak the truth. And the truth is, our ocean's in trouble. And the cries are very loud if you're listening. The waves are telling us stories if you're watching. And the indigenous people, if you look at indigenous people all around the world, they are hurting by these changes. Our diets are different. How we get salt is different. Things have changed. I'm all about change, positive change. But when this change is ill and affects our people, it hurts my mouth, it hurts my innermost part of me. So I thank you all for being here. I thank my little sisters for standing with me. I hope this beautiful ocean, ocean symposium gives you and it carries on with you so you may carry on and spread the truth about what our ocean needs. It's Malama Okeka. Can you say it? Malama Okeka. Malama Okeka. Ka'ahua. Malama Okeka. Ka'ako. That's everybody. So malama oke kai ka, malama oke kai ka ua, malama oke kai ka ko, malama oke kai ka ko. Pai pai lima, pai pai lima, pai pai lima. Eo 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 ea ea. Mahalo for malama. Mahalo, mahalo, Sister Ui. We have a big connection with Hawaii here, big. We're not only connected by the ocean, but a lot of that culture and a lot of the people from Hawaii sail back and forth to this west coast uh, way back when. And a uh, lot of shared history there. Thank you so much, wow. So, we are ready to begin to hear our presentations. We are first going to hear from Howard Garrett who flew down from Whidbey Island and rented a car and made his way through the infernos and herds of deer crossing Highway 101 and barely got here, but he did, without his hair on fire. Thank you for making that trip. Thank you so much. I, I cannot even begin to thank you for all of the whale research and observation and work and love and time that you have put in to the ocean and to the planet. Since 1981, is that right? Or earlier than that. Anyway, he and his wife Susan founded Orca Network in 2001. Um, they are dedicated to raising the awareness of whales of the Pacific Northwest and the importance of providing them uh, healthy and safe habitats. He gives presentations on orca natural history, conservation, captivity issues in Washington and beyond. And I know you work with a lot of fellow scientists up there that we know and love. Um, he uh, has been interviewed 
for stories about orcas, including the film Blackfish, that some of you may have seen. And uh, his focus is on the southern resident orcas, right, of the Salish Sea and coastal waters, now down to only 73 members. And with that said, Howie, would you come on up and take the stand? Let's give Howie a big hand. Thanks so much. Okay, let's get this queued up and actually show it. Wonderful, perfect. Uh, thank you all for being here and thank you to the organizers, to Scott and Tree and Tai and Andy and everybody. We put on events kind of like this and I know what it takes, a lot of meetings, a lot of phone calls to line everything up. So I very much appreciate the opportunity and everyone being here. Um, so I'm going to launch right in. I've got a lot to cover here in a little while. So what I want to start with is this graphic. I love this graphic. I think it's incredible. It shows so much. It's by a dear friend of ours, Sue Kochia. You can find her work in airports and shops all over. And she is a, a big devotee of orcas and doing whatever is necessary. And this graphic shows so much because, of course, it's the orca and free the snake, which is the topic that I'm gonna cover in this talk. And I'll explain what that is. As a standalone slogan, it can be misunderstood, but it has a great meaning. But all the other critters depend on what the snake produces, what it provides, which are primarily the salmon, the fish. Uh, but also this guy here kind of is what I feel like when I keep hearing they won't restore that river. They need to right away. So, okay, let's get right to why we're doing it. This was the tour of grief that shook up the world. Uh, probably many of you, it was a year ago last August and September that uh, J35 Tahlequah gave birth and within a half hour that baby died. And she carried her deceased infant around for 17 days, 17 days of intense in attention. And you know, there's a lot of speculation. Did she intend that to be a message? I don't, you know, can't confirm, but it sure was one. It went around the world. It reverberated everywhere. These whales are in deep trouble. They're, they're dying young, they're dying even before birth. It's terrible. Uh, so she really brought the attention where it needed to be. And that was followed within weeks by the death of J50 Scarlet, also followed by media attention around the world. It was amazing. They were the best uh, awareness raisers. I mean, you know, that we don't want any whale to sacrifice to carry a message, but that's what they did. She was much beloved. And what I want to try to you know, impress upon you is that we know these whales. Up there in orca country, maybe down here too. And by the way, you know, those whales often come right by here. L-pod, K-pod, some of the southern resident orcas of Washington state travel right past California down to Monterey, in fact, uh, in search of food. So they are much beloved up there. We know them from birth, we know their stories, and we grieve when they die. This was just one friend who is an artist and a naturalist and who, who drew this graphic to show her feelings, her memorial to J50. She was so acrobatic, so friendly, so curious, and she died at less than four years old. So this is the numbers. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of emotion involved in this, but there's also 
the straight numerical demographics. They were at 74. This is from the Center for Whale Research as of last July 1st. They were at 74. They are now at 73, as Taiyi mentioned. Uh, it's, it's a drastic decline, and it is compounded by the reproductive failures, the inability to bring about the new generations. And it's been studied from many different angles. Many, many scientists are, are trying to figure this out. And this is one, it's called photogrammetry. And it's a way of, of looking from overhead. It was originally done with helicopters and then drones came along. So now it's done by drone to take a look at how, how they look from above. And a lot can be measured, can be understood from an overhead shot. Um, and this sort of helps to show some of what has been learned. Two thirds of pregnancies end in miscarriage. And they don't see the pregnancies until they're about halfway through the 17 month gestation. But two thirds of those that they see, females that are pregnant, never give birth. And this is another graphic illustration. This is September 2015, J17, Princess Angeline, looking nice and plump. But by September 2018, you can see the distinct difference. She's got skinny, turned very skinny. And then in May 2019, even skinnier, and then disappeared just last August. She was a, a grandmother, a mother of four. Uh, one had died, but three other still living offspring. Uh, and now they don't have their mother. And that, that is way premature. Their lifespans are very much like human lifespans. You can easily just compare that way. So that's a 42-year-old female, still very vibrant, very much a, 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 a vital member of her society, just at the upper end of her reproductive years. But the thing about orcas, uh, and I'm going to bring this out in the afternoon talk more, is that uh, they are the only other animal besides humans where females have a long menopause, which means a long post-reproductive lifespan. So in other words, she was just entering that elder female phase of her life where they impart their ways, their traditions, and teach the young, and she passed away. And this is another way of finding all that out. This is uh, Tucker, the original poop-sniffing dog. Uh, and now there's a new one. I hope I'll have time for the video at the end to show you the. this has been going on for several years. And, and now there are new generations of poop-sniffing dogs. But so much can be found out. The ID of the whales, this, you know, the poop-sniffing dog can sniff some fecal matter from a quarter mile to a half mile away, depending on the breeze. Then the researchers come up with a fine mesh net, mesh net and uh, scoop it up, analyze it. And they get all kinds of information. Reproductive status, host and prey DNA, uh, nutritional status, stress hormones, pathogens, toxins levels, diseases and pathogens. And all of that is extremely valuable and has shown this kind of information. Again, 69% of all pregnancies fail before birth. Low availability of Chinook is endangering the habitat. That's probably the fundamental take home message is that they're lacking in sufficient diet in enough Chinook. And I'm going to explain a little more this afternoon about why they depend almost entirely on Chinook, one of the five species of salmon. Nothing but the biggest and the finest, of course, but they have traditionally, over hundreds of thousands of years possibly, depended on Chinook salmon for their sustenance, for their survival. And those are in dire straits, and that's where I'm going with this talk. Uh, so it's the Columbia Snake River and the Fraser River runs, that's up in Canada by Vancouver, 
that supply most, that are the big producers, or historically have been the big producers of Chinook. And the conclusion is it's all about the fish. And the lead researcher, Sam Wasser, said, we've got to look at the Snake River. What is their impact? And this is sort of the, the, the standard pie chart that shows the percentages. Chinook, salmon, 82% of their diet. They will have a side dish of other species of, of salmon uh, and occasionally uh, a, a, a steelhead. And there's even been you know, other species very rarely that are found in their, in their scale samples or fecal matter. But 82% Chinook, almost entirely. And this is just to sort of give you an indication of why we know they depend on those Columbia River, Snake River, Chinook. For most of every year, nobody sees these whales. This was done by satellite tagging, which is a terrible thing. I, you know, I love the data, but I hate the method, you know, to put the satellite tag in with, with hooked barbs into their flesh. It ended when one died of that in 2016. So that's, that's on hold now, but the data show, and this is just typical, this is just one day of one whale of the eight that were tagged. So, but it is representative of what most of the satellite tag tracks showed, which is they hover right around the mouth of the Columbia, right where those Chinook, after two, three, four years out at sea, growing big and fat, are finally headed back in and they get to the mouth of the Columbia River and that's where the southern resident orcas hang out. They're, they're there to feast on them. That's their main mother load of food. So, you know, every indication is they depend on those salmon. Just want to establish that for sure. And where do those salmon come from? Here, 5,500 miles of pristine, roadless, primitive wilderness area. There is still that much left in the United States in central and southern Oregon, uh, Idaho. And it is an amazing, uh, just a, a wonderland, a, a, a cornucopia of life that is deprived of its lifeblood because of these dams. And this sort of gives you a sense of, this is that wilderness area in Idaho. This is the Snake River, which is the primary tributary into the Columbia River. The Columbia River has its own dams, but it is these four higher elevation Snake River dams that are the death knell, that are killing the salmon. But you can see it's a direct lifeline straight to the ocean and out here, is where the orcas are waiting for their food. And this is what it used to be like. Big old fish, gigantic salmon. They were called June hogs because they were the high altitude Chinook that would go into the, you know, 5,000 feet of elevation up to where they found the spawning streams. And they got really, really big. They don't get like that anymore. You don't find them. If you, if you can find a, a 50 or 60 pound Chinook, you've pretty well got a record anymore. Uh, so they, they, just, they just don't come out like that anymore because they've, well, for many different reasons, uh, but they're very few and they're much smaller. And it looks really bad for this year too. There's been a bad streak. Um, there used to be well over a million, uncounted, nobody really knew, but well over a million, and now we're talking maybe 48,000, and 80% of those are hatchery fish, which are weaker and smaller than native fish. Uh, so it's much more work to catch enough to get the caloric intake to survive. So a lot more work uh, for smaller fish. And as uh, Ken Balcom, who is the founder, director of the Center for Whale Research, who's been conducting the population survey uh, since 1976, 
and when we get to the video, you'll see he still gets out on the water. Uh, and his assessment, looking at the reproductive failures and the whole population trend, is that uh, they're not going to survive if we can't bring them more salmon in short order. Uh, and this is sort of the, uh, the graph that is the University of Washington, Columbia Basin uh, chart that shows the smolt to adult return, which is the best way to measure uh, the ability of the fish to survive, to maintain their numbers at all. And to really recover in any kind of healthy way, you have to have at least 4% of all those fish that go out into the ocean to get back up into the spawning beds to be able to reproduce the next generation. And at 2%, there may be stability. It's very much uh, iffy at that point. At 1%, they're headed toward extinction. And look at that. I mean, they're down to almost 0% of the smolt to adult ratio. So here's why. It's these dams. There are four of these dams. And this is actually a, a artist's illustration of how to breach them. And it's really easy. I mean, you know, I, I don't really need to oversimplify the case because the Army Corps of Engineers does. This is the page out of a 2002 environmental impact statement published by the Army Corps of Engineers, which is who built and who owns and operates all those dams and who has the authority right now to unilaterally, to issue a record of decision, it's called, to declare the dams non-operational, which is lingo for useless, not producing anything of value. Um, and to bring them down. And all they have to do is push down the earthen berms. Unlike most dam removals, you don't have to blow up concrete. It's really not too expensive at all. I mean, you have to do some other mitigations and preparations to do it, uh, you know, shore up some embankments and, and do some preparations, get all the boats that are upstream, downstream, if they need the locks to go down. Um, so, you know, a couple of months of preparations and to, you know, modernize some of the aspects of the study. But then you go in with the earth moving equipment and you just dig a notch in that earthen berm. It may have pavement on top, that's easy, but you dig a notch on that earthen berm and then you let the water level rise and start to flow through the earth and it will gradually cut its own channel and you'll have a free flowing river once again, just like in the Army Corps' own illustration. It's really a no brainer it's, and, and not horrifically expensive. The, the best estimates by economists today is that the entire process would cost about $400 million, which may seem like a lot, but much more than that is being wasted to keep the dams in place every year. Federal appropriations are coming into the region to operate and maintain the dams and to mitigate, as required by the ESA, to try every conceivable way amazing hardware has been designed and barging of smolts and every other way to try to help the salmon survive the dams. And five court, federal district court decisions over 20 years have declared it ain't working. Go back to the drawing boards. What you're doing is not working. You have to start talking about the dams. And by the way, just uh, the mention of the Fraser River up at Vancouver as the other source is also in trouble. So we need to do everything possible to get more salmon to these whales. And this is just to show you that we will sacrifice our dignity rather than sacrifice our southern resident orcas. Uh, that's Ken Balcom. Uh, that's a, a retired Army Corps of Engineers uh, civil engineer who has been a great whistleblower inside source for amazing 
uh, information on the economics and, and the politics of the Snake River Dams. And that's me in the full body orca suit <laughs> over there. So, uh, you know, we'll do anything. That was when uh, President Obama uh, came to Seattle and he and Governor Inslee uh, gave a, a, a big uh, event. And so, yeah, we're, we're yelling at him. We've tried every other way. Uh, full page ads in the Seattle Times. This has been going on for four years since we have really upped the, the, the ante and the, the level, the amplitude of our campaign to try to bring down the dams. There's a small core of us that have been working on these issues for a long time. We're trying to make it clear to them. Uh, Ken also does the more distinguished thing, as we all have, of giving presentations to try to spell out the case and make it all as clear as possible. Um, and partly, hopefully, maybe as a result of that, Governor Inslee, uh, in uh, March of 2018, actually declared a, an, an emergency and an executive order. We've got to restore the rivers, restore the food source, or well, I mean, really, he was nonspecific. He was a little more ambiguous, I have to say. We got to help the orcas. It's called the Orca Recovery Act. And that created the Orca Recovery Task Force, which was uh, almost 50 uh, representatives of the agencies, meaning the Army Corps, the Bonneville Power Authority, which is who markets all of that power uh, and sort of oversees the, the financial end of it. Uh, and NOAA, which uh, writes up the biological opinions, which are the basis upon which they make those decisions, whether to keep the dams or not, and they all say, oh, you, we can keep the dams. They all seem to agree on that, and they were the members of the task force whose mandate was to figure out how to save the whales, and they've got heavy investments in many ways in keeping the dam. So it was doomed from the start. Um, I think of it now, and this is after two years of meetings of all of these people, uh, not just agency people, a lot of industry people, a lot of regional politicians, a lot of other people who basically know very little about orcas or biology in general. Uh, but they have their own interests, their own groups, their own uh, constituents that they have to speak for. And of course, they don't want to sacrifice anything. So, you know, the orcas are not that important in relation to where they're all coming from. So it was really doomed from the start. Um, and in fact, in the beginning of it, they didn't even want to talk about the dams, even though five federal judges had said, you've got to start talking about the dams over 20 years. They started the task force without even any mention of breaching the dams. So there was a huge public upwelling of, of demand. We've got to start talking about the dams. Um, and finally, in midstream in August, while J-35 was carrying her dead calf around, uh, the governor asked the task force to consider breaching the dams. Put it on the table, at least, please. Uh, so they did, and that formed this uh, Snake River task force group, uh, breakout group, to talk about the dams. And so they met off to the side, and they came up with these questions. And that's where they left it. And we've answered all those questions. We were in the room, but we were not allowed to speak. But we could have answered all those questions for them right there with documentation, and yet they just wanted to ask a few more questions and then put it back on the table and walk away. And that's basically what they did. Um, the task force made a lot of recommendations. In fact, they're just about to make their final recommendations in uh, November. Uh, and I, I've sort of come to think of it as the Everything But Orca Recovery Task Force. Uh, there's a lot of restoration uh, in Puget Sound and, and uh, a lot of 
you know, climate change uh, recommendations and, and uh, you know, they focus on the boats, uh, you know, as being the big problem and it's really not. It's about diet, it's about sufficient food. Um, they want to, you know, cull the pinnipeds, take out the seals and sea lions, and that's a peripheral issue. And it, you know, is fraught with all sorts of other problems, including depriving the other type of orcas, which is a whole matter that I'll be getting into this afternoon. The mammal-eating transient orcas depend upon those pinnipeds. Anyway, they did a lot of things that are irrelevant to saving the orcas and they did not address the real issue, which is how to bring about the most salmon in the shortest time, and that can only be by breaching the dams. Um, and this is part of why. This is just a representative of the backlash, of the ingrained, deeply uh, well funded and, and organized opposition to breaching the dams ever, and including you know U.S. representatives and and chambers of commerce and public utility districts and port authorities and and they're all organized along with of course uh, editorial boards of newspapers, and they said taking down the dams is a waste of taxpayer money. Even talking about it, to which we respond, what really? Um, I'm assuming that's what the orcas say about that. Um, so this is a, a columnist in Seattle who said the Snake River Dam's battle has lasted longer than the 30 years war. It just goes on and on. Uh, and what they have all sort of been pointing to for the last several years has been this new EIS process that is due to announce something in the spring uh, about what they're going to do about the whole Columbia Basin. All, I believe it's 18 dams and sort of they mix the Snake River in with all of that. So it's gonna be very vague and ambiguous. And, and uh, so people have been hoping that in that process, somehow somebody in there will say, well, maybe we ought to breach the dams, you know, that Noah would come up with a biological opinion that would indicate that they should breach the dams to provide more fish to save the orcas. That is not going to happen. Uh, there's been enough indications now that they will just sidestep that whole question and come up with, you know, I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be irrelevant to saving fish or orcas. And these are some of the best, by the way. I mean, this is not just one run of Chinook salmon that we're talking about. These are the last remaining high altitude, big Chinook salmon in the lower 48 and equivalent to anything in Alaska. And of course, they're continuing to die. This was J-17 who was in the previous slide, but who was declared missing uh, August of 2019, um, and two others. So, you know, they're going away. And uh, it's, it's just, it's really hard to take when there is a solution. So I'm gonna show you how to get that solution done. There are two congressmen, two U.S. representatives that are very key to getting it done. We need more, but you gotta start somewhere. And this is a, a true red conservative Republican in Idaho who loves fish and who cares about the fact that the fish are disappearing too fast. So he has come out and said, we've got to talk about the dams. And he announced at a, at a big conference in Boise last April and just completely uh, paralyzed the house. They were just, they were riveted to what he was saying because he kept talking about what we need to do to breach the dams. He didn't quite take it over the top and say, I recommend breaching the dams. He just says we've got to look at all these parameters and everything that he looked at, you know, indicated we've got to breach the dams. Uh, so he's very close, but he stands alone. 
and he's getting a lot of, of uh, backlash from a lot of quarters all across the spectrum. Uh, so he needs support. We need to send him some support. But more locally is your own congressman, Jared Huffman. Now, he, I haven't seen any commitment from him, any you know, uh, confirmation that he is in favor of breaching the dams. But I do know that he is very well informed on the dams, in part because our friend Scott Mercer sent him a letter, I suggested, uh, and then that he answered. Uh, first, it was with his uh, assistance uh, but I've actually you know, heard from him that he wants more information. He's very interested in this topic. He knows everything that I've been talking about. He has the, the real information, the real facts. And this is how you can get in touch with him. Um, and he could be very, very valuable. And this is a brochure that I have out on the table out there. and I. I hope everyone will take one, take a look at it, and read it. And uh, please take it home with you. Take a few more if you've got friends or family that might be interested. I don't want to take them back. So <laughs> please, please uh, uh, take one if you can. So please get in touch with Congressman Huffman. Give him your love. I think he's a fantastic guy. Yes, question? Thank you. I right. Know him and he is, he's very personal and he's definitely worked Yes, yes, he's a very good person. Yes? He's going to be in Fort Bragg on Saturday, November 9th. He'll be in Fort Bragg on Saturday, November 9th. At Dana Gray. At Dana Gray? Okay. Elementary school. Oh, elementary school. Okay. Um, all right, well, you can talk to him there and just say you've heard all about the starving orcas, the need to breach the Snake River dams, and please do everything you possibly can. What I am very embarrassed to say is that there is not one Washington political elected official who will support breaching the dams at this point. That backlash, that pro-dam lobby contingent so well-funded, so systematic, so entrenched, and with a long history of misleading the public uh, since before the dams were built, just to get them built on false promises, is still very active and so is, is harsh, will you know, uh, punish any p politician that wants to act, ad, you know, advocate breaching. Um, so that's our job is to get a Washington representative to support breaching up there. I would like to say there is some hope because some of the smaller dams, there's a couple in California that are coming down. And I know Huffman is very uh, involved in the ones off, off of the Eel River. Um, so maybe that will help set some precedent for what can happen up north. If, if they can see up north that, well, they're doing it down south and it's successful and it's helping the runs. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. That is exactly right. There are many good examples of the success of breaching dams for bringing back, you know, whole wilderness. I mean, as that first graphic I showed illustrates, it's not just orcas and not just salmon. It's a whole, in fact, by one study, 137 species of mammals and birds and amphibians and reptiles that depend on those salmon reaching the high country. Uh, and that's what happens when those dams are breached. They're, they bring the ocean nutrients up into the forest and, and you find uh, the, the, the signals from the ocean in the trees, in the plant life up there. So, I mean, it completely supports the entire uh, wilderness ecosystem. And just to show you why we still have hope, here is one of the two new babies that was born in 2019. Uh, this is three-month-old J56, uh, seen first in August of this year off the town of Tofino, and hence has been given the name Tofino. 
Uh, so with that, thank you very much for listening. And Wow, thank you so much, Howie. A um, lot of information there. Our, our next speaker is going, going to be uh, Scott Mercer. Thank you so much. I, I want to let you know, uh, Howie, you didn't say this, but you, know, you, you study these orcas, you observe them, you get to know them. They have personalities, families, their matriarchal society. Uh, the pods, they don't share DNA, right? I mean, the pods are kind of like these systems that are real families. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary. And I can only imagine the heartbreak you must feel as you see the lack of food and witness these whales that you have been observing for decades, starving to death. So, uh, really appreciate all that information. And we do have orcas here off our coast, and um, we'll be talking about that too. So, uh, and remember that we do have a panel after our next two speakers, so you can ask more questions then. Okay, really excited about our next presenter, Scott Mercer. He's the co-founder uh, with Tree Mercer. Uh, the Mendonoma Whale and Seal Study, right down here in Wallala. And um, we're so lucky to have somebody who has been researching marine mammals since 1974. Long, long time, decades, where he has been studying the behavior of marine mammals in our oceans. Um, it goes on and on and on. He's got quite the bio. Uh, I don't know what else to say, Scott. If you want to say anything else, I've got a long bio here, but I think you should just come on up and continue with that introduction. Once you step, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Nobody wants to follow Howie in a talk. Well, Howard Garrett and I go back to, uh, we figured out the other day, it was 1983, and um, first lesson, don't lean on the podium. Uh, he and I were uh, on the roof of a boat, we were reminiscing the other night, in Massachusetts Bay, right in the shipping lanes, going into Boston Harbor. And we were watching a mother, mother with her five-month-old calf. And um, since we're in the middle of the shipping lanes, right, right away a very large um, tugboat came along, towing an even larger barge. And we both stand there holding our breath as at first the, the tug went over the mother and calf. They dove upon hearing them, the ship coming. And then the long cable, and then the even longer barge went over them. And then as soon as the barge was over them, they both popped up, and I don't know what was louder, the mother and calf breathing or Howard and I breathing. And we <laughs> saw them come up. It was amazing, though, that the mother knew exactly when that barge was over her head. Um, last night, right at the time the siren went off, um, if you were here last night, that film that Michael Stalker introduced, um, Sonic Sea, had just reached a point where Thank you. Okay, we have our own roadies. Um, they, it just reached a point where it was showing um, uh, an, important, uh, tra an important point in the researching of noise in right whales, North Atlantic right whales, took place. I'd just like to tell you what you missed if you were here. Um, Rosalind Russell, who is Scott Krause's wife, had been, and Rosalind Russell is a, uh, I mentioned Krause for a reason, his name's gonna come up again. Um, Rosalyn Russell is a marine mammal veterinarian at the New England Aquarium, and um, she and the entire New England, whale, the New England right whale team from the aquarium, uh, New England Aquarium right whale team, who went to the Bay of Fundy, or have been going into the Bay of Fundy for many years to study right whales in the summering grounds, 
And um, you saw Howie's uh, black dog there on the slide. Um, they use a fecal smelling dog, as Howard showed in his slide, to locate right whale poop. And there's great importance to gathering the poop. You can tell what the whale is eaten, and also measure the amount of um, glucocorticoids in there, or um, uh, stress hormones in their, in their body that are expelling out with the, uh, with the waste. Well, they did that every day, collecting this. And whenever they could find the uh, whale's fecal material floating, and it's easier than you think, because when they go, it covers an area the size of this floor, if not bigger. And, um, but the dogs are very good at smelling it. Well, they collected every day, and they had very high levels of uh, stress hormones in the whales. And they were attributing that to the noise in the ocean, which you know is cutting out their sounds. And many of the whales have even raised their voices higher to try to get above the background noise caused by shipping. Well, along came, this was back in September of 2011. September 9th occurred, and George Bush shut down all of the shipping and um, airplane travel in the country. And the aquarium kept going out doing their baseline data every day. And they were collecting uh, fecal material. And when they analyzed it, um, all during that time where Bush had shut down the shipping and the airline traffic, the amount of stress hormones dropped considerably when that background noise was stopped. And then um, when they started the shipping and the airline traffic again, the hormone levels were running back up again, stress hormones. So um, it, was, it was a good indication. It was a type of experiment that really can't be um, replicated again under those conditions, have that kind of quiet take place. Okay, um, well, I go back quite a ways with right whales. I saw my first right whales in 1978. Um, Scott Cross and I were out on a boat out of Seabrook, New Hampshire. It was actually the first uh, whale and seabird trip that I ever led. And um, I hired Krauss to help me out with this because he had more experience than I did. And the first two whales we ran into were North Atlantic right whales. What we didn't know at the time is that they were both pregnant. And because um, um, they showed up in Georgia back in the wintertime in February with calves. Now it wasn't known that, it wasn't unknown that that's the place that they, should, they have their calving. But um, it was a good indication, and there was a background of that that had been done by other people. Okay, what's happening with right whales is um, there are about 411 of these um, right whales left, and only seven calves were born in 2019. There were none born in 2018. We were hoping for seven calves this past year, and we got seven. But unfortunately, nine whales have died since then. Um, the ninth one was found in September floating off of Long Island, New York. So we, get, we got seven and lost uh, nine, so a net loss of two. In the last 21 years, 20, the last two years, 21 right whales were found dead, including several females. And the effect of these current and future losses, this tiny population is devastating. There are about uh, 100 females left. And um, at the rate the females are being killed in entanglements and um, ship strikes, uh, they could be, uh, there couldn't be enough females not left in the population within 20 years that they won't be able to recover. So they could be extinct because of the loss of uh, reproductive females. Okay, their range, uh, Scott Krauss and I went down to the southeast coast of the United States in 1984 to start doing systematic surveys of the area off of Georgia and Florida. And we found that um, we did find mothers with, uh, in the middle of winter in February and March. We did find mothers with newborn calves. Now the, um, I got it. <laughs> um, right, the pregnant females come down here to have their calves. And then in March, they begin working their way up the coast here. Uh, in other right whales from parts unknown in the North Atlantic, we don't know where they, the rest of the right whale population spends this winter time, um, but they come in into the Great South Channel and they're joined by the mothers with their calves up in here. And they begin feeding very heavily on copepods, very small zooplankton that feeds in turn heavily on um, diatoms and other plant plankton. 
Yeah, this is uh, the Great South Channel is just south of uh, Cape Cod, down in this area. It's not quite where that blob is. It's kind of down in here, near Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. That's Long Island, New York there. So it's kind of in here. Uh, after they feed heavily in the Great South Channel, they move up into Cape Cod Bay. And uh, you can find sometimes 80 right whales right in Cape Cod Bay feeding on uh, copepods. And then they move up the coast of New Hampshire and Maine up into the Bay of Fundy, or it happened historically. And that's where Roz Russell did her work with the uh, fecal material. But re in recent years, the last six or seven years, the right whales haven't been going in here. Um, and the reason is the water's warmed up so much and the copra pot production dropped off so badly that they can't find enough to eat. So they showed up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence up here and immediately 18 right whales were killed up in here by ship strikes and entanglements. The Canadian government under Trudeau did a good job of immediately um, ordering the ships to be slowed down coming into the, into the St. Lawrence Channel which helped quite a bit, and also shut down part of the crab industry in this area to reduce some of the entanglements. Okay, this is a copepod right here, and this is what the right whales feed on. Now, we knew a long time ago that um, if right whales began, uh, if right, something happened to the environment, or well, there was a lack of copepods, since they feed almost primarily on copepods, um, Unlike other large whales, they're feeding on a variety of prey items that if they lost this food source, they'd be in a lot of trouble. Well, that's why they moved out of the Bay of Fundy, and they actually uh, began moving into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, as I said, to, to find colder water and more copepods. Now, it's unlikely that the right whales um, got together and said, let's go try the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It may have been in their cultural memory that uh, they knew to try up there, or they maybe may have just been following colder water, colder and colder as they went, and got up into Canadian waters. But uh, these copepods feed voraciously on plant plankton, and uh, plant plankton has a, a little glob of oil in it to keep it afloat, to allow it to photosynthesize. And when they do, um, they fill up with, uh, become a good source of omega-3. of omega-3, so at lunchtime, if you want to get on the headlands and jump in and do some filter feeding, it may be beneficial to your heart to load up on these. Um, Calanus glacialis is um, one species they like. Uh, Finmachicus is the one they really prefer, Calanus finmachicus. And, uh, but they will also feed on pseudocalanus. Uh, pseudocalanus elongata is one that they're not above feeding on if these aren't available. But this whole body thing here, body capsule fills up with oil and becomes a rich food source for them. If you eat a ton a day, and um, how many of you will admit to watching SpongeBob SquarePants? All right, good, because the story behind that, that uh, show is that some guys from Humboldt who were majoring in marine biology came up with that show because they saw so many funny things under microscopes and they just couldn't help themselves. But copepod is that little wisecracking green guy with the one dot on his head. That's a copepod, which is what you have here. There's the antennae and the, and the red eye spot right there. And this is a right whale feeding. Uh, you photo identify right whales by photographing these thickened skin growths called colossies up on the top of their head. They're in a different place on each right whale. And right in here, these are the baleen plates hanging down. And these hang down. So they kind of overlap, and it's made out of keratin, like your fingernails and toenails, and your, <coughs> excuse me, and your hair. And on the inside of the baleen is very hairy looking. But you'll notice here that there's an opening in the front. Most baleen whales have this shut tight with more baleen. So the fish they feed on doesn't escape as they lunge at it. These guys just move along slowly, moving their tails. And as they do, the water flows in. They move their tongues up and down inside their mouth, forcing the water out through the baleen plates. And when they feel that the inside here is gummed up with those little copepods, then they close their mouth, they'll shake their head up and down, uh, rattle their head back side by side. You hear the rattling of the baleen sometimes when they do that. And the water that's inside their mouth helps to, have, helps to slosh down the copepods, and then they swallow and start again. 
Now, exactly how they find these, the amount of copepods they want to feed on, we don't really know. Uh, through plankton toes that have been done by the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, uh, they follow right whales around very slowly and do plankton toes in the areas where they stop, so they get an idea of the density. But uh, right whales will search around like a, a house fly on a corner, until they, on a counter, until they uh, find the density they want, then they open them out and they begin feeding. And this is what an entanglement looks like. It's another Scott, this is Scott Landry. There's a lot of Scots on the East Coast photographing whales. This is Scott Landry. This whale was entangled in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and swam 600 miles with 300 feet of rope around its mouth and through its mouth and around its body. It was, it was, it was wrapped up so bad it couldn't move its right flipper. It still swam uh, six, uh, 600 miles to get down off the coast of Provincetown. And I'm not saying they knew that the best rescue team in the world was there, but it, it, they came out and rescued it. Uh, these guys risk their lives every single day. You can see the helmets, they wear some body padding. And these are tools that they, they, they themselves invented for um, freeing the whales. This all through um, trial and error. They got this whale free eventually. But this is the baleen right here that you saw hanging down. This is the way it's supposed to look. It's not supposed to be sticking out of the front of their mouth, like you see here. This whale, uh, we hope, is going to live. It was emaciated when it got down um, into, the, into the waters off of Massachusetts, where Scott and his team came out and, uh, and um, freed it. Did it survive? Uh, we hope so. It was still alive as of uh, a month ago, last I heard about it. Uh, that ropes like that can um, amputate limbs. There was one whale that had the rope go up into its brain case. Um, now the big um, issue that's going on in Maine right now, uh, Maine lobster, um, there was a move on to get the vertical lines in, in Maine reduced by 50%. Uh, that was opposed by lobster, the lobster industry. And the idea was to bring in um, ropeless gear, as Scott Landry says. If there's a vertical line, it's eventually going to be, eventually going to be an entanglement. <clears throat> so the idea was to reduce the vertical lines by 50%. Um, since lobstering in Maine is basically a religion, and uh, it's been fished, they've been taken the same way for hundreds of years, there's a lot of resistance to this. And at first, the Maine Lobsterman's Association, <clears throat> excuse me, um, endorsed the idea but they just recently pulled their endorsement of it. And unfortunately, both U.S. Senators, Susan Collins, I usually get a chorus of booze when I mention her name. That's better. <laughs> and Angus King, uh, both have opposed the regulations to um, reduce the number of vertical lines and also to, um, it started bringing in the uh, ropeless gear. So, um, so for now, they still get entangled and ship struck. Um, unfortunately, one of the arguments that the lobster men are presenting is that um, the right whales aren't showing up in Maine waters anymore because of climate change and the water warming up and moving up into Canada. Well, what they're not thinking is eventually climate change is going to impact their business, so they're going to lose their lobsters either way. So. Um, sometimes they're slow to come to food chain conclusions. Okay, the Gulf of Maine warming up, as you can see here. The Gulf of Maine actually is warming up faster than any other body of water, on, ocean body of water on the globe. And um, their temperature is reaching 70 degrees now in the Gulf. Now this is um, northern, Maine, northern New England and Canada we're talking about, not the coast of Florida and Georgia. 70-degree uh, water showing up in these areas, and um, what that what sets off a, a domino effect, where uh, water that warms up expands, so you get higher high tides with a little more force behind them, and it goes up into the estuaries much further. It's warm water invading up into the estuaries, and devastated the main softshell clam industry, which is second only to lobster in uh, seafood take. And also, uh, as they went up into the estuaries, it uh, badly damaged the salt marsh areas as well. So you have an effect there with less, 
as the water warms up, you have less phytoplankton or plant plankton, which is less food for the zooplankton. And I should mention before I forget that uh, the world's oceans, the phytoplankton in the world's oceans um, re remove 100 million tons of carbon every day. So not only do, do those little phytoplankton give us a lot of oxygen. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, those little, little green cells that only give us a tremendous amount of oxygen. They also remove 100 million tons of carbon every day. It's a little time lapse of how the Gulf is warming up. It doesn't stop, does it? Okay. All right, I'll have to. <clears throat> Okay, now moving on to uh, gray whales. That wasn't depressing enough. <laughs> the gray whale unusual mortality event, or UME, as you call it. Um, since January 2019, there's been elevated gray whale strandings that have occurred along the west coast of North America, from Mexico through Alaska. This event was declared a UME by NOAA on May 31, 2019. The most recent abundance estimate from NOAA is nearly 27,000 whales in a 2015 to 16 survey. That seemed like a lot of whales. We were saying 20,000 and suddenly we were saying 27,000, but I was never very good in math and statistics, so I'll take their word for it. Now that work was actually done uh, down in Granite Canyon over five seasons to come up with that high number. Okay, this is a combined 2019 gray whale strandings in California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska compared to 99,000 UME. So at this angle, let's see, the light blue was 90 to 99. The dark blue was 2,000. And we're 2019. Now this, uh, the really high one here was, was associated with a bad um, El Nino out here. Now this is an average of, from two, an 18 year average, the black, and this is just this year, 2019. I forget to say something, just yell. I'm used to Tria pushing the button here for me, so I got too much to think about. Okay, the uh, gray well standing, strandings by state. Alaska, Washington, Oregon. Um, you can see where California had the high, and Washington did it. As the whales move up into Alaska, this number was going up, up, up very quickly in the spring. And then the country here, U.S. leads. Oh, down in Mexico, there were quite a few. As uh, my, Michael's mentioned last night, Michael Stalker, that uh, first that was noticed down there were skinny calves, skinny mothers, and just skinny whales in the area. There's a juvenile that came ashore on uh, Lemon Tower, down in Point Reyes. One of the many dead ones. Now, one thing that I need to mention here is, um, I'll even go back, maybe. Uh, the number of, number of dead whales was 209? 212. 212. Right? And uh, so, with only about, um, I watch my thumb. Um, we, for every whale, every whale that we know is dead, uh, we estimate there were 10 we didn't know about. Uh, that's because gray whales, unlike right whales, tend to sink when they're dead. And uh, also, there's many nooks and crannies on this coast. You can lose whales. Just imagine how we could wash into the lost coast with nobody around there. So we think there are over 2,000. Maybe getting close to 2,100 dead gray whales. And this is the, most of you know this, this is the path of the gray whale migration up through Unimac Pass, where your next speaker has spent a lot of time in this area, the Aleutians, up into the Chukchi Sea, the Bering Sea, and the Beaufort Sea. Other question? Yeah. What are they so close to the coastline? That's a good question. Well, it, 
the ones behind the kelp fence. Well, they, they're not feeding. I'm sorry. They, they, they used to go behind the kelp fence to protect the predation for the orcas. So that's and so they're orcas oh. flattened, just like the right one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 They are close to shore as to opposed to being out here, but they're still a couple of miles out. Most of the gray whales that we see northbound um, are still quite a ways offshore, but not that far offshore. What was the answer to that question? I couldn't hear the question. Well, the question was um, why are they so close to shore? And the uh, traditional answer was that they're trying to stay away from um, orcas. Since orcas, uh, the, tra the transient orcas will, will attack the uh, mothers, especially the mothers and calves, but um, in Monterey Bay, the calves are kind of uh, free game down there for the transients. They move into that area knowing that the mothers and calves are coming by. But we do see, um, we're out every day during the, during the census, and we do see that um, many of the northern, northbound whales are a couple of miles offshore. So mothers and calves just skim right in close. Okay, that showed um, the warming up of the waters in Alaska. All right, this is um, the ice algae. The, um, the ice algae um, grows on the bottom of the ice, as you can see here. And this is probably a melt hole right here where the light's getting through. The um, Algae, the ice down there is uh, 2.8 million years, has been in, in existence 2.8 million years, nearly 3 million years. So the uh, ice is the ecosystem in the Arctic. Everything is, is uh, timed around the ice. And most, some recent work down there has shown that um, even though the ice in April, there's very little sunlight, the ice is uh, where it is, is, is at its thickest. And sometimes there's a foot of snow on top of some of it. And the ice still only needs 0.02% of the sunlight to photosynthesize. So it can, uh, you know, if it was up on top, it would have 100% of the available sunlight. But down below like that, it can still work with only 0.02%. Now, there are thousands of animals, invertebrates and small fish, that will come up and feed on this ice, on the algae. And it's a good early food source when the um, daylight increases or begins to increase. And uh, the animals come up to feed, which would be um, planktonic animals and also small fish. And here's a photograph of um, an, a melt pond on Arctic sea ice and some of the uh, plumes of um, algae that's down there. Uh, in June, when there's more, when there's more open, open water, even more all the time now, more open water, um, there is. This, that's when the um, diatoms and the plant plankton begins to bloom very heavily. So first you have the ice algae as a food source, and then the animals rely on the increased amount of plant plankton and, and the increased amount of invertebrates like copepods feeding on that, which uh, supports uh, feeding by fish. And it, it affects every trophic level from um, copepods and other zooplankton right up to um, polar bears, walruses, and seals, and eventually um, whales feeding in the area. This is what um, phytoplankton looks like, various um, cells of it. And some of these are copepods, and some of this is krill in here. To Arctic amphipods. Now, the, the gray whales that we have feed on, on amphipods primarily, not, on, not entirely, but mostly on amphipods. And as uh, the ice algae will eventually, some of it falls off and drifts down. It's, it's fed on by organisms on the way down the water column. When it gets down to the bottom, it's fed on by the amphipods that the gray whales feed on. If you haven't seen gray whales, or if, uh, you probably haven't seen them since they do it underwater. But when gray whales are feeding, they make pits in the ocean. 
They were all up in their mouth. They had very thick baleen. On the, on the right whale baleen you saw was five or six feet long in some cases. We have a couple pieces at home that are like three feet, four feet long. And it's very flat, very um, flimsy and fragile. On a, on a gray whale, it's um, short and stocky because they come in on the bottom and they open their mouth and they roll. And that's to dislodge amphipods from the bottom and they make these big pits in the bottom of the ocean which are very helpful to the ecology of the bottom of the ocean because they're overturning the bottom and aerating it. And then they'll uh, get, take a mouthful of amphipods and force the, wa force the water out through the thick baleen plates and, and then swallow the amphipods. Well, they also try to emit the sand at the same time and then swallow the amphipods that they caught. <clears throat> okay, where the fecal smelling dogs come in, uh, this is a whale that's um, pooping. And uh, Howard Slidey has shown a, a black, like a black lab. All of the best fecal smelling dogs I've encountered are all black labs. Um, if you have a black lab at home, it's just laying around the house. It seems to have no direction in life. You might try steering it toward fecal smelling. Whale fecal smelling, there seems to be a growing field there. Because these whales poop. As I said, the area will fill, it fills up about the size of this floor right here easily. And I've had the um, pleasure of seeing it thousands of times when you're out on feeding grounds. And um, it fertilizes the top layers of the ocean. So people ask, well, what good are whales? What does that matter to make to me if the whales die? Or they go extinct? And you know, not only would the world be incredibly boring, as Roger Payne once said, insufferably boring, but um, if we only had ourselves to look at, but um, especially Donald Trump, and you know, I guess you like looking at yourself. But um, the uh, one, one thing they do to benefit us and help climate change is by pooping so much. And when there were more whales, you can imagine there was 10 or 20 times more poop in the ocean. And that, photo, that um, fertilizes the top layers of the ocean and makes a natural fertilizer very high in nitrogen and, and iron to, um, fertilize the plant plankton, which causes tremendous blooms, which grab carbon out of the air and give us back oxygen. The only person I know who ever got that wrong was Ronald Reagan. And there's his famous speech about trees cause air pollution. That was right, I think it was the same speech as one redwood, you've seen them all. <coughs> uh, he actually said that. Um, he had it backwards. He thought they took in oxygen and gave off carbon. So we have a, I'm serious. I have an animated cartoon here, not this one, but the whale emits a large brown cloud that the black uh, labs find, and then um, it's fed on by uh, phytoplankton, I'm not sure what they're doing in there, but phytoplankton, which is fed on by zooplankton and eventually whales. I think this will be loud enough. We need sound. Oh, well, I can't narrate like the Englishman who does this. I push that. Yeah. Where's Andy when we need him? In the discovery of widespread. ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. We all know that whales eat fish and krill and some people, certain politicians in Japan for instance, have argued that killing whales is good for human beings as it boosts the food available for us to eat. And so you would think. But as the great whales declined, so did the numbers of fish and krill. It, it seems counterintuitive. Surely their numbers would rise as their major predators disappeared. But it now turns out that whales not only eat these animals, they also keep them alive. In fact, they help to sustain the entire living system of the ocean. 
whales feed at depth in waters that are often pitch dark, and then they return to the surface, to the photic zone, where there's enough light for photosynthesis to happen. There they release what biologists call fecal plumes, vast outpourings of poo, poonamis. These plumes are rich in iron and nitrogen, nutrients which are often very scarce in the surface waters. And these nutrients fertilize the plant plankton that lives in the only place where plants can survive, the photic zone. Fertilizing the surface waters isn't the only thing the whales do. By plunging up and down through the water column, they also keep kicking the plankton back up into the photic zone, giving it more time to reproduce before it sinks into the abyss. Even today, the whale populations have been greatly reduced. The vertical mixing of water caused by movements of animals up and down through the column of the oceans is astonishingly roughly the same as the amount of mixing caused by all the world's wind and waves and tides. More plant plankton means more animal plankton on which the larger creatures then feed. In other words, more whales means more fish and krill. But the story doesn't end here because plant plankton not only feeds the animals of the sea, it also absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When eventually it sinks to the ocean floor, it takes this carbon out of circulation, down to a place where it remains for thousands of years. The more whales there are, the more plankton there is. The more plankton there is, the more carbon is drawn out of the air. When whales were at their historical populations, before great numbers of them were killed, it seems that they might have been responsible for removing tens of millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year. Whales change the climate. The return of the great whales, if they're allowed to recover, could be seen as a benign form of geoengineering. It could undo some of the damage we've done, both to the living systems of the sea and to the atmosphere. News on some moment of Zen. Um, I recall that at the end, the whale moving their tails up and down through the water column also helped to stir up and cause uh, an endless gratification. Causing gratification is what water warms. You know, warm things rise. So you have warm water on top. You don't get as much plankton production. But warm water doesn't support the phytoplankton growth. So as um, when you have, you may have noticed, you keep track of water temperatures like we do every day. It gets up near 60, and we have such some really nice flat, calm days, which are great for us for looking, but not so great for water temperature. And then we get wind for a few days, and temperature drops down to 54, 55. And I know Tristan gets some really cold temperatures down where she lives with her um, scuba teams. But up where the buoy is, it'll be 55 to 59 most of the time, and then with several days of warm, um, we get up around uh, 60, and then it drops again when we get some wind because that causes mixing. It doesn't have to mix from the bottom up. You can just get down right a ways and uh, just colder water, several meters below the surface. Saltier, denser, and will come up and bring nutrients with it that are suspended in the water column. Are there any questions? Taiyu says no. <laughs> Thanks so much, Scott. We'll be able to ask him more questions later when we have our panel here in just about 30 minutes. Um, that's a lot of great information to take in. Uh, how are we all doing out there? Good? OK, our next presenter is Doug Forsell. He lives in Wallala, just right here. We're so lucky to have you right here, one of our local observers. Um, he um, first moved to Northern California in the 1970s, uh, has a master's degree from Humboldt State where he studied wintering belted kingfishers. 
One of my favorites, thank you very much. The belted kingfisher along the Mad River. He worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from 1976 until his retirement in 2012. And um, spending 10 years in Alaska, wow. Four years on wildlife refuges in the Central Pacific Ocean and 22 years working in the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic coastal waters. Thank you very much for being here. He's gonna to talk to us about seabirds and really appreciate your being here today, Doug, thanks. I'm gonna figure out how to get my talk up. Yeah. So I started to do this talk and thought, uh, well, I'll go and get examples from all over the world of other things, and then I realized I pretty much have. No, that's not it. That's not it. <laughs> okay. I'll get rid of that. It should be. That one? That one. Gotcha. Uh, okay. And decided I had, start from the beginning. Yep. Yeah. Good. All right. That I had actually worked on enough projects that I probably had good examples of most of the things I wanted to talk about anyway. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about threats, solutions that have uh, been devised and things of, that have eliminated the threats over the years and some of the mitigations we can do when we can't uh, get rid of the threats. So first of all, seabirds are, well that's weird, it's cutting off the talks, that'll be interesting. Um, they're long lived, age of first breeding is usually two to eight years. Most raise less than one young per year, um, but they make up for it in living a long time. Their foods are generally fish, uh, crustaceans, shrimp, euphausids, copepods, amphipods, and squid. Sea ducks are a different group that live out in the ocean, but they're uh, more long, uh, they're long lived also, but not as long, but they have a much higher um, uh, fecundity, so they raise uh, a lot more young per year. They eat bivalves, gastropods, worms, crustaceans, and some fish. So uh, numbers of birds, unlike whales, that you only have a few species to study, there's 188 species that hang out on both our coasts in North America. On the Pacific coast, we've got about 120 species of birds, uh, including the loons through shorebirds um, and others. On the Atlantic coast, where I spent 22 years, we have uh, less birds and 7 to 20 million, I forgot to mention. On the Pacific coast, we have 30 to 60 million um, seabirds. Uh, one of the characteristics that we all uh, uh, usually know in most of the birds, uh, at least the uh, seabirds, is they hang out in colonies. These are traditional places that they come back to. Over the years, we have found that they're a little more plastic. We used to think they only went to one colony, and once you wiped out that colony or something, you lost them, but we now know that they move around a little bit more. Um, most of them during the winter, this is the tufted puffin distribution uh, throughout the world. So they breed on islands and then go out into the abyssal ocean during the, uh, their winter and non-breeding and some of them may stay out there for two or three years before they start coming back to the colonies. A lot of the seabirds, uh, the long lived ones, do something similar. Uh, some of the seabirds migrate down the coast, such as these loons. These are Pacific loons right now. You can go, go out and see a lot of them. There's about a million of them that come out of Alaska and go down the coast. Um, lesser numbers of uh, common loons and red-throated loons, but this is the most abundant loon. Uh, we used to put together nice, simple stories like this. We knew that lots of shearwaters bred in Tasmania and New Zealand went up to Alaska, some went into the Bering Sea and spread out along the west coast. These are shearwaters migrating at, near the equator. They essentially make an 8,000 mile trip without feeding. There's no food out there for them to eat or very little. Um, then when we got GPS trackers, we found out the whole story gets a lot more complicated. And so these are individual birds that they're able to track and uh, see the way they 
migrate, so essentially they're covering the entire Pacific Ocean, which incidentally, the Pacific Ocean is essentially half the world's surface. A lot of people don't realize quite how big it is, but um, it's half the world's surface and the depths are very deep, 10, 15,000 feet deep. So uh, it's an incredible amount of habitat. So this is, um, I guess we're going to have everything cut off at the top. For some reason, the slides are all moved up. I don't know if anybody knows how to fix that. Um, so this is some Unimac Pass, where all those shearwaters come into up in Alaska. Um, some gray whales here. Essentially, all the gray whales going into the Bering Sea pass through Unimac Pass. It's about a 20-mile wide um, area. It's the biggest concentration area probably in the world of birds and whales. And um, <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> Does anybody know why this thing is doing it? I don't see it here. So I, yeah, strange. Anyway, um, so one of the things we found out, uh, this is East Coast migration. So generally, we think, oh, migration is just during the uh, uh, spring and fall for a couple of months, but essentially there's some birds migrating essentially all the time across the, along the coast. So any activities you're doing out at sea and stuff have to deal with uh, extended migration. You can't just go out and say for a month and say, okay, now we've figured out migration because loons may not do anything. Maybe I think framing on the projector. Framing on the projector? Yeah, sorry. Um, we'll try and keep going here. Uh, so essentially, the reason the birds are where they are is because that's where they, they feed. I think we'll have to wait a minute here. Well, we can talk about the surface feeding birds. <laughs> so one groups of birds, some of them chase other birds and take their food away from them, such as frigate birds and uh, some gulls and jaegers, things like that. Some surface feed, some go under the water, some dive under the water and pursuit feed, such as um, gannets and, uh, and then we'll talk about some that feed from the bottom, such as uh, scoters, uh, stuff. But essentially, wherever they are, it's because that's where the food is and how they're uh, feeding. That's okay. If it looks like, well, I'm not sure, but I think, oh no, it's still off the top. That's still cutting off the top. That's fine. We'll just have to deal with this. Um, so this is a map of uh, U.S. areas. It's a weird map because Canada used to be blue. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, it's just changed. Uh, okay, the, these are different fisheries. Unfortunately, I don't think this shows up, but these are supposed to be, uh, represent nets, and the green ones are fisheries that have been eliminated or uh, gotten rid of. These represent longline fisheries, um, some that have gotten rid of if they're in green, and some that are, uh, if they're still red, there's still fisheries going on. God, we just went through this talk earlier. Everything was fine. Okay, one of the uh, first projects I worked on related to fisheries was the High Seas Japanese gillnet fishery. This is out in the um, Western Pacific. Japanese uh, uh, fishery had 115 catcher boats, each putting out 15 kilometers of gillnet each night. Um, they were in our, our territorial waters, or our EEZ, to 200 miles for six weeks. Then they went into Soviet waters and international waters, and we weren't allowed to have observers when they were in those other areas. Um, we had National Marine Fisheries Service and Fish and Wildlife Service observers on the vessels. And um, uh, so these are mostly birds coming up inside the nets. 
Uh, this is an unusual take, but they did take a lot of birds. These are immature puffins, laysan albatross, some murres, a lot of shearwaters. And so that, that, uh, this fishery was eliminated because it was uh, more than the birds. It was also catching about 5,000 doll porpoise a year. And um, they were also catching a lot of salmon. And so these fisheries that caught the salmon while they were two-year-old, three-year-old, was really wasting a lot of salmon. And salmon migrated all the way over to the Atlantic coast and uh, uh, or over to the Japanese coast and go back, some of them. So we managed through trade uh, tariffs and other things related to imports with Japan and stuff to get rid of uh, most of those fisheries. Another fishery I st uh, that was studied in uh, Puget Sound was uh, by Ed Melvin, dealt with seabirds. Uh, they swim underwater, so they go into a gill net and they're caught just like fish uh, are caught in a gill net. They can't back out because their feathers get them stuck in the nets and they drown. So they, they did a study to uh, try and eliminate or figure out how to get rid of, uh, reduce the bird bycatch if they put a 20 mesh white uh, uh, net in the top of the nets, they could reduce bird bycatch by 45% and only uh, salmon catch by 15%. If they put 50 meshes in, they uh, eliminated too much salmon. They tried some acoustic alerts, but, and it did uh, work, but unfortunately it attracted seals and sea lions and they then ate the fish inside the nets. So uh, time of day, the salmon were relatively similar, but the uh, dawn auklets, a lot of less auklets were caught at dawn, and um, also less murres. Birds tend to feed in the morning and evenings. Uh, also the timing of the fishery. As far as the murres were <coughs> concerned, um, most of them didn't come into the Puget Sound and, uh, until about the third week and most of the salmon were caught in the first week so they could fish during this part of the time and catch less birds. They finally developed a 20 mesh, 1.8 meters white twine and no dawn fishing so that reduced their bycatch by over 50%. Uh, that was implemented in the commercial fishery. I, I'm not sure whether it ever got implemented in the tribal and uh, Canadian fisheries. So a study I worked on on the uh, east coast of the U.S. This is Assateague National Seashore. This is a red-throated loon dead here. There's another one here. There's another one there and another one there. Uh, we were studying nearshore gill nets that are just beyond the surf zone, the worst place you could think of to put nets for birds because that surf and that mixing zone is where all the fish are and most of the birds are. Uh, We uh, couldn't get an observer program to uh, do something. That's a, a traditional way they study things, but it's also an incredible bureaucracy. And so the fishermen, if you tried to do an observer program, they would delay it for five or 10 years uh, through lawsuits and other things, and it happens most of the time. So we just went out and studied them from the beach. <laughs> so they couldn't keep us from watching them through spotting scopes and couldn't keep us from doing beach bird surveys. So uh, we broke the beaches out into 10 meter for censusing the birds offshore and um, then along the beach we counted the number of dead birds and mammals and so on along the beaches. Um, these are just some maps of some of the areas. This survey went from New Jersey all the way down into North Carolina. Uh, this is Maryland and Virginia areas. Essentially, the red little icons indicate a, a dead bird. The blue lines indicate where nets were. So essentially, where nets were, there were dead birds on the beach. Where nets weren't, we didn't find any dead birds. Pretty simple, basic biology, but uh, um, and this is, uh, where is this, Delaware, Maryland, it's mostly Delaware. 
and same thing. Um, where there were nets, there were birds. The gist of the thing was essentially there were 10 times the number of dead birds on areas with, within a kilometer of gill nets and um, than there were without. And the, uh, I'm having trouble seeing my, yeah. And um, the other thing was this, this study was the first study and perhaps the only one that I know of that we were able to demonstrate an actual population effect. So the red indicates uh, the shores are about equally sampled, almost identical. I forgot to mention that on the last slide. Um, but birds per kilometer of beach. So these are live birds that we count offshore. So red burst, breasted mergansers, there's half. Cormorants, there's less than half. So we were actually able to demonstrate that the loons actually were being killed and it was wiping, actually wiping out the population in that area. A lot of these are migrant birds, so they move up the coast as a spring fishery. They land in the area. We numerous times while watching fishermen, I could look out and uh, I remember in New Jersey from a hotel room seeing two loons come in that night and the next morning I see him throwing them out of his gill net. No, they're drowning. So they, 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 they fly into the net essentially while they're chasing fish. The whole concept of a gill net is that they're, they're monofilament, clear monofilament, so the birds can't see them underwater. So they fly into them, their feathers get, won't bend back, they're all meant to bend down. They get stuck in there and drown. So how are they washing up on the shore? That's well, then they, the, when the fishermen pull them in, they throw them, they throw them out. Well, sometimes they do. Once they found out we were watching them, they started hiding them and started taking them in their boats back. Some of them took them in their boats back anyway. It's illegal, but it, they also make great crab bait. And so some people use birds for uh, bait. So the, this fishery, this study was one nail in the coffin, but um, there were also other things, porpoise getting killed in these nets and other things that we managed to eliminate this fishery uh, through a lot of politicking and, and it also uh, got Fish and Wildlife Service to adapt a policy, a national policy on bycatch, which took us two or three years to negotiate with a lot of meetings. Uh, Longline fishing, uh, this is where ships out in the ocean, large ships are deploying long lines, uh, lines with thousands of hooks on them. Each hook is baited. They go out the back of the ship. Um, the birds try to get the, grab the baits and get hooked and drug underwater and drown. These are, these lines go down to the bottom. Some can be pelagic. Um, some go down to the bottom. Uh, they're usually, they're, they're almost always uh, uh, factory ships, so they're dumping the offal and the waste out the side as they process the fish, the guts and the other parts. So the birds are attracted and they're eating all that stuff. So in a way it provides a lot of food for them, but it also is a death trap for them. In the North Pacific, we have the um, Short-tailed albatross, this is a hooked um, uh, laysan albatross, but um, short-tailed albatross was, is an endangered bird. Because of that, we managed to, uh, in Alaska fisheries now, there's an observer on every boat. If they catch two albatross in a year, well, two in two years, they shut down the fishery. So they've gotten really good at, uh, at avoiding uh, catching uh, albatross. And part of the way they do it is these are called tory lines. They're lines that they run back out so the the line with the bait on it is going down here and they have these other lines hanging above it so the birds can't fly underneath and get down and get the bait. Um, they can also drag buoys behind on the tory lines and that keeps the birds back thinking there's something going on with the buoys and uh, back by them. And there's a ton of other things that we're 
tried, some are used, dyeing the squid bait, uh, weighted lines, uh, dumping the offal from the opposite side of the vessel as uh, where you're deploying. Uh, there's chutes that were developed to put it down through a metal chute to keep it the, uh, the hooks and stuff away. So they've managed to mitigate that pretty well. This was a much bigger issue in the uh, southern hemisphere. Um, there are 18 species of albatross that are endangered or close to being endangered down there, mostly from longline fishing. And some's legal and some is not. The legal fisheries have been pretty well mitigated, but there's a lot of illegal fishing. Okay, so um, uh, this is so funny that Canada disappears when it gets on the screen. Um, so this was the, the fishery I talked about up here. Gil, these are gill nets, green and red. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the East Coast. Um, uh, there's still a, a hook fishery in Lake Okeechobee uh, that kills a lot of um, scop. Um, but the gill nets were eliminated from South Carolina and Florida years ago. Um, just took two women in uh, South Carolina. I was talking with the uh, waterfowl biologists, and they said we were told we weren't allowed to say anything about this, but two women went out, found a bunch of those red-throated loons on the, on the beach, the same as uh, I did, and they went to the legislature with a bunch of pictures, and in two years they got uh, gill nets outlawed in uh, South Carolina. Unfortunately, the gill net fishermen from Florida and from South Carolina moved up to North Carolina and began catching thousands of birds. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually an illegal gill net on the Illinois River. I forgot to mention that. So there, there's also a lot of birds that are caught all the way up into the lakes in Canada and along the Mississippi River. Um, this is an illegal gill net and uh, 38 scop and some ruddy ducks. That, that's one night of an illegal gill net. Unfortunately, those fishermen that moved into uh, Abermile Pamlico Sound in North Carolina have wiped out a large number of scop. I had one fisherman who told me his brother used to catch 400 scop in a night. And um, this is one of the last great flocks that we found in uh, North Carolina of 17,000 scop. But uh, they declined radically on the East Coast. Some of the studies we used to do, um, these were late spring bird studies, and these are gill nets. So we started looking at, as we were doing surveys, where are the gill nets and where are the birds. So unfortunately, a lot of birds move up into these uh, estuaries or up these rivers, the Rappahannock, the Potomac River, and over on the East Coast, they're in, um, this is Delaware Bay. Uh, so essentially, you can look at a place if you've got gill nets and you've got birds in the area, you've got dead birds. And so it makes it a lot easier. You don't have to go out and study. <laughs> it's just a matter of physics. The birds are going to be swimming with the nets. These are some gill nets in Delaware Bay. It's hard to see, but from the air, you can, there's three nets going out here you know, from shore. Uh, it didn't work very well. Um, so essentially, we found that long line, long line fisheries you can mitigate for it. And uh, uh, other ones you can't. Well, I'm only at 22 minutes, OK? So uh, it doesn't wrap up that soon. <laughs> I think I need to. Uh, some of the mitigation you can do. Uh, this is uh, removing derelict fishing gets, uh, nets. Northwest Fisheries Commission, these are nets that are just down underwater. In Puget Sound, they went up and started finding them with sonar and divers going down and pulling them up. This is one net worth of uh, cormorants and mers uh, that were in these nets. Uh, oil birds, so now we're going to talk a little bit, that was fisheries, we'll talk a little bit about habitat. Um, this is the Alaska oil spill, where it was in Alaska. Uh, the Exxon Valdez, this is where it would be on the East Coast. So it would have pretty much wiped out our whole Northeast Coast. 
I did a lot of studies on uh, wind turbines and the effects. Um, one of the problems is this is they want to put wind turbines up right in the middle of the channels of the, this is Delaware Bay. This is the busiest oil port on the East Coast. And going into New York, the same, has a lot of oil there. And they want to put up turbines right near the shipping channels, which are cement <laughs> things that would rip a hole in a thing. Um, sand mining, um, Assateague Island, uh, this is Ocean City, Assateague Shore. This was Assateague after a storm. They have to dredge and pull the sand out. We did a study for uh, Minerals Management Service, or BOEM. Uh, these are shoals offshore. They're not shoals that are, they're shoals that are ancient things as the coast has moved back. They're not coming back. They're not a renewable source. So we call it sand mining. They call it borrow. Well, there's, they're not putting it back, so they're not borrowing from it. Um, from the studies we had done in Chesapeake Bay, uh, these were habitat suitability modeling. Essentially, we found out that scoters are on 90% sand or better. Um, we did surveys offshore. Uh, it's hard to see. This starts at New York, Delaware Bay, going down through the winter. We did an aerial survey every uh, nautical mile over a period of four months. The, Planes we use in Fish and Wildlife Service, counting a 60 meter transect. This is like a flock of 5,000 scoters. Uh, we also look for concentrations over those shoals. Essentially, we came up with birds in those areas. Uh, this is scoters. Um, most of them are around uh, on the sandy shoals. Uh, we did some GIS where we took the densities, calculated, buffered the shoals, and then calculated densities on the shoals as off the shoals. And all the birds were more abundant on shoals or near shoals, and uh, scoters were 10 times more abundant. So unfortunately, accumulative effects. Um, we got wind facilities, sand mining, gill nets, oil spills, aquaculture, shipping and disturbance, overfishing, clam dredging, hunting. And uh, these birds also have a higher mercury and lead load, so now they also have to face all these and they're dumber doing it. Uh, just a little thing about um, concentrations of birds. Talked about, uh, this is Delaware Bay. Uh, this is an old quote from Fire Sign Theater. Uh, every time I went back to Delaware Bay, I would try and say, okay, today we're gonna find this and we never find the same thing in the same place and it's because whatever they're feeding on moves around so you can't do surveys and predict where those concentrations are going to be this is some aerial surveys along the coast large flocks of uh, is the mouth of uh, Chesapeake Bay um, uh, large flocks of uh, uh, scoters but it's only you know February 14th to March, by March they're gone, and they're not there the next year. I don't have time for that. Uh, Oasis on the Flyway is a project we worked on trying to find these concentrations. These are the most common concept of it is horseshoe crabs and uh, red knots feeding on them. And so, I uh, don't have time for the shit. All right, so I'm going to talk just quickly about colonies. So that was out in the ocean. Now talking about colonies, I used to live on Johnston Atoll. This is uh, the island. We had uh, towers with uh, uh, 38 guy wires uh, supporting them. Lots of birds got killed. Uh, Five to 15,000 nested underneath these wires. This is a frigate bird with a broken wing. Um, Sometimes you can just do simple things. So we went out and cleared grass on another island and managed to attract 200,000 of the birds out from under the tower over to a different island to uh, breed. This is like two days after we cleared it, and within a week we had the birds nesting over there. We also moved pallets and bricks over to make artificial nests and trees. And this is the first frigate bird nest uh, fledgling uh, away from the 
wires. Unfortunately, USGS brought in some plywood that had yellow crazy ants. And after we had cleaned off the entire, all the military base was removed. They then spread out and killed huge amounts of birds. And uh, we've had five years we've been poisoning yellow crazy ants down there. These are some islands in the Pacific. This is Baker Island. I used to be a manager of these islands. The military left large amounts of 1,000 barrels of oil and uh, tar. It's a tar uh, frigate or a tropic bird. We burned those and got rid of them, took the barrels out so the birds didn't fall in them. Boobies would nest on top of these, then fall in and die. Um, this is a, we just go out and do simple things like turning over the barrels so the birds couldn't um, fall into them. Invasive grasses and plants are a big problem on a lot of islands. Um, there's a pile of different animals that have been introduced onto islands. Lucian Canada goose was one of the most successful recoveries. These are the birds you see in large V's going by here now. Um, and in the spring, uh, they got down to about uh, less than 400, nested out in the western Lucians. They had to uh, get the foxes off of a lot of islands, stop hunting in the area, and then we had to figure out how to capture them and take them over to other islands and reintroduce them to these islands. Um, now the population is over 170,000. And so it's probably the most uh, successful endangered species thing, but it required killing foxes on a lot of islands. Uh, some of the other islands that I had worked on, Rose Atoll, had Polynesian rats. These were some eggs, a picture I took at night. These eggs had just been laid and the rats ate them within an hour of them being on the ground. There were so many rats on the island. Um, this is a trap, and there were really so many rats that two could get caught at the same time. Uh, we had to poison them, put the poison inside tubes so that uh, the hermit crabs and things didn't eat the poison. Uh, Jarvis Island had cats. A lot of islands had cats. Essentially, you have to shoot the cats. It's, it's not something anybody enjoys doing, but you have to do this to recover the islands. Um, this is uh, Jarvis Island. This is the number of species that have been recovered since uh, 83 when they got rid of the cats. Um, also problems with uh, birds that are overabundant. Um, this is Rat Island. Uh, it was called, uh, unfortunately you can't see the top. Uh, this was called Rat Island and now it's called Hadaka. Um, when I was surveying these islands in 83, I pulled up my boat on the shore. We were gonna go off and uh, look at, uh, take a hike on the island. I looked out and there were rats everywhere all on the shore. There were so many rats on this island. They had wiped out all the birds. They'd been there since the 18, uh, 1700s uh, when a ship went aground. And so a major project of Fish and Wildlife Service was to aerial drop poisons throughout the island, and they managed to get rid of the rats, and now the birds are coming back. Um, <clears throat> these are loons. This is National Marine Fisheries Service bycatch uh, data from their observer programs. These are mostly loons and gannets. These are mostly greater shearwaters. Greater shearwaters migrate from up there, we used to think they came down here, but once we started tracking them, we found out they follow um, uh, fronts and weather. They come down, come back to South America, and go out to Gough Island. So this is a picture that's a little disturbing. It, this is mice eating a young chick, so don't look at it for uh, 15 seconds if uh, you think you might be disturbed by this. Gough Island, uh, this is a trust in al albatross. There's less than uh, 2,000 of them left in the world. 90% of them live on this island. This bird died two days after this. Uh, this is the biggest uh, poisoning plan uh, so far. They need $10 million, and they're hoping to uh, start next year. And um, if you, well, unfortunately, you can't see it, but if you want to donate, if you look up Gough Island, you can go to uh, goughisland.com. 
And uh, there's two endangered species on this island. There's millions and millions of those short-tailed, or um, sorry, uh, greater shearwaters that nest on this island. So by getting rid of these mice, we can save, uh, you know, there's a million chicks that are being eaten by mice every year. G-O-U-G-H. Uh, it's in the Trussen de Kuna group. So recently, we've had a uh, proposal to get rid of the mice on um, the Farallon Islands, and there's been a lot of misinformation about it. And, you know, it's never easy. You have to poison things. You can't get rid of them by <laughs> going out and putting mice traps out and things like that. Um, there's ashy storm petrels. Half the population lives on that island. The mice are eating the chicks. It's just plain and clear. So if you're opposed to putting poisons on an island, you're essentially condemning the chicks to die. And so they ended up pulling it back because they got a lot of people who said they were opposed to it. Um, so I, I would just say that, you know, these are biologists that are, A, risking their lives to go out and do this stuff. It's not like it's a, a whim that we're going to go out and throw this. This has been planned for 12 or 15 years. And uh, we don't go out and kill things just to be killing them. You know, we're trying to do it the best way possible to save the birds. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, stop overfishing, to uh, mitigate, um, reduce, uh, re reintroduce extirpated species, protect habitat, get rid of the birds that are overabundant, close dumps, and things like that. Um, lighting on ships. This is a bunch of shearwaters that, like a thousand or two thousand shearwaters, crashed onto a boat from lights out in the ocean. Um, Locally, <laughs> we got a lot of cormorants, but we also have an abundant supply of uh, ravens that are being fed by people. And this was a movie of, but I'm going to skip it. So this is a picture I, um, I used to live on a nuclear test site, Johnston Atoll. This was a picture I found in the trash can one day. And this was open water nuclear testing back in the uh, late 50s. I did have a movie that went along and showed all the nuclear blasts offshore. But I used to keep this on my wall uh, just to kind of remind me of the amount of effects that used to happen and how many, how well off we are now on a lot of things in the ocean. So there were, um, you know, hundreds of aerial nuclear tests back in those days. In the 40s, think of all the oil spills from sunken ships and stuff during World War II, all of the rats, all the cats and things on all these islands. There have been over 500 islands that have been, the um, species have been eliminated, the uh, predators. So even though we're facing <laughs> huge, uh, uh, almost unsurmountable things with uh, climate change, in a, a lot of ways, a lot of, um, there's a lot less perturbations than there used to be. And the seabirds have luckily managed to get through that bottleneck. And, sorry. Can you, can, can you address the common year die-off that happened either earlier this year or last year? Yeah, I think we're going to have a panel, so. Yeah, we are. Hey, fabulous. Sometime, yeah, wow, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was amazing, Doug Forcell, everybody. That was incredible. Often when we think about the ocean, we forget about our seabirds out there. And uh, it's something to really think about. There was a question about the common murr die-off and so on. What we're gonna do right now is have a panel with our presenters that are here at the symposium. So if you please come on up. This is a time that we, the audience, the uh, witnesses, viewers can ask questions. If you had a question like Kira, you had about the, the common murr die off, what's going on, this is the time to ask. And um, maybe we could put a card over that projector. Um, so we've got a great lineup here, and we'll be talking. We don't have that much time, we're running a little over, but.
We'll probably break in about 15 minutes for those of you that are thinking I want lunch. Um, uh, but we are going to have about 15 minutes here. Um, when we put the symposium together, we didn't want it to, to be all scientific information and uh, stories from the scientists, but we wanted you to get involved too, because a lot of the symposium is about how do we take action. And uh, so we have, in case you've forgotten, Howie Garrett. Thank you, Howie. We've got Scott Mercer Tree. Are you joining us? OK. We have Michael Stalker, Doug Forsell. Jeff, are you in the audience? Jeff, you come on down. We've got Jeff coming down. He'll be on the panel later this afternoon. Jeff Jacobson, who is one of our uh, great orchid specialists up in Humboldt. Um, and do we have Tristan? Is Tristan here? Well, when Tristan comes in, we'll get to meet her. She's going to be talking to us about subtitle environments this afternoon. She'll be one of the presenters. So if you guys see Tristan, you send her on over to the panel, OK? Yeah, let's have all the lights on so we can see everybody. Um, so here's our panel. And uh, I would like to start by asking a question and then seeing what questions we have from the audience. But um, I'd like to hear from each one of you, how do you not get paralyzed when you hear all this bad news? And then what gives you the motivation to take action? So if we could hear from you guys. Oh, I guess I should take the mic off. Oh, you have a mic. Uh, I like to take a deep breath, um, and I, I look for solutions. I look for, you know, I, I don't try to weigh the, uh, you know, probabilities, because nobody really knows, you know, all there is is now. So let's look at what is possible, what could be done, what, what would be a solution, if only we would smarten up and try to you know, suggest that in any way possible and not worry about, you know, the overall picture. So, I mean, you know, be aware, but not uh, fretting all the time about what it looks like it's becoming because it's now still. Yeah. Well, I always hope that every little bit that everybody does contributes to our knowledge and uh, may affect some policymakers somewhere along the line. So it's a matter, I get very depressed sometimes, but it's, uh, it's a matter of not really giving up and just keep uh, working away, getting, collecting data and trying to um, find out little bits of information. You never know what little bit might uh, make a difference somewhere along the line. I was trying to think of, uh, there, have, there have been some s small findings here and there that have uh, made a difference. Um, can't think of one at the moment here, but there are small, small little findings here and there, uh, like the uh, finding, like the one uh, circle graph that Howard showed of um, what they mostly feed on, and then those small slivers of other species of salmon that they uh, they do feed on, gives you an idea of, of um, the importance of, of breaching the dams, so that uh, there's a free flow of water. I mean, it's documented now that that's what does the work. It's not just a matter of taking down dams. It is actually important to these to uh, seven or eight species of salmon. Thanks. Yeah, um, that is really a challenge. Uh, we as conservation scientists are always looking under the hood, and we're seeing these systematic problems. We're seeing lots of um, you know, kind of a homeostasis is kind of falling apart. And you know, when I was a kid, my mom used to stick me you know, next to a stream bed and I'd be gone for the rest of the afternoon because I, there's so many little critters that you could look at. And this is really not the case so much more. So there's systematic depression that's happening with a lot of us scientists and it's st starting to be addressed um, by people. But I saw a quote the other day, which was uh, to the effect of, you know, we can do the studies, we can look at mitigations, we can come up with, with various types of management plans. But, but the real problem is, uh, is kind of rampant greed, and, and that's a spiritual issue that we don't really have the tools to address as scientists. 
I don't think I got uh, got the chance to explain it, but one of the pictures I had was when I first went to Jarvis Island in um, 1977 and uh, got off the boat and started looking around. There was a picture of a whole bunch of dead birds. There was essentially a dead bird every square meter. And there were 200 cats on one square mile island and a couple million birds, and each cat was eating three or four birds a day of sooty terns or bigger ones. Um, essentially, I saw that and I, I was just appalled. And as I, over the years, it took us uh, eight years for the Fish and Wildlife Service to get it together and get rid of them. I used to call them every year and say, what are you doing about this? And I finally, to get rid of the, the cats on Howland Island, uh, I volunteered, took six weeks of annual leave to go down and shoot those. Um, essentially, it comes down to a lot of times uh, people aren't going to get it done unless you go do it yourself. Done. Yeah, good point. Haven't you noticed that most conservation efforts, when it comes down to saving a river or whatever, whatever, it comes down to one person. Often one or two people are out there really pushing the work forward. Uh, what's easier to change, human tradition or the breeding cycle of a fish? One could wonder, and we've got lots of examples in the presentations today and that are all around now of how it can work. You know, the Navy used to do nuclear testing, on and on and on and on. Well, we have changed. Our ways are changing. That has its own pace. So how can we as individuals accelerate that pace by focusing the rest of the population on stuff that does work, on solutions that are out there, and still maintain our optimism? We have no choice. You know, so the optimism is the way forward. Otherwise, you get dragged down into that other abysmal pit. And, um, just keep saying Tice's quote every day, and off you go. Yeah, thank you. That reminds me of that Margaret Mead quote that I think we all know really well, but I want to just say right now, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has, and that's what you're saying. You know, that, that one person changed the river. Uh, these are things that we have to keep telling ourselves, remembering, and find our allies and our local community to do that work. All right, so thank you very much. Let's take some questions from the audience now. Yeah, we've got beautiful Howie Garrett here from Whidbey Island. We have our local resident. Sounds like a local resident whale. Anyway, Scott Mercer, Michael Stalker, who's from Marin, uh, Doug Forsell, and Jeff Jacobson from Humboldt, but really up and down the West Coast, and as far as you can see. Um, okay, questions. Kira, you had one. Yeah, wondering about the common murder die off that happened recently here on the coast. Wondering about the common yeah, murder die off. <laughs> Yeah, wondering about the common myrrh die-off that happened here up and down the coast where hundreds and hundreds were counted. So May 15, there's a big storm hit here, really hard, really cold. Um, the director of the NOAA weather station in Eureka said it was record-breaking for the amount of waves, the amount of wind, and how cold it was. A bunch of birds started washing up. and that was like unusual and et cetera. Common MERS, they were all flying south and we were out there doing our boat surveys. We collected a bunch of MERS out there floating around and they seemed to have been starving, uh, no food. June 10, around that time, there were three or four very, very hot days. And Dan Barton, who does um, marine, uh, seabird surveys all up and down the coast, is a professor at Humboldt State. He was watching a colony of MERS that just started leaving the rock and getting into the water and just floating around and ravens were coming in and picking up eggs. So there were a lot of eggs there. The BLM drone flies over, he looks at the pictures and finally understands that the birds were so heat stressed that they're not tropical birds, they can't thermoregulate in, in hot climate like, so they abandoned, pile, and there's piles of blue eggs on top of green rock off of Trinidad. 
And so it seemed to be a double punch that that's how we didn't see any chicks. Um, I saw two chicks up just north here near um, Bear River, whatever, and um, seabird surveys that were active all up and down the coast were more, more or less they found none in Northern California, only a few in Oregon. So whether it was from the, the weather impacting and washing birds off of rocks and give it, hitting them hard so they were so stressed they couldn't forage effectively in order to breed, and then the other heat wamp, um, the thermal stress had them abandoned piles of eggs. Uh, a lot of seabird, seabirds go through these boom and bust things, so many, uh, and then they're also exacerbated by human activity. So like the Bering Sea right now has, there's a lot of stuff going around about, they're estimating millions of birds are dying, these shearwaters and stuff that move back and forth because of the warm water up there. Um, it happens a lot, it happens a lot with individual birds. If you think about a, a bird that lives 50 or 60 years, or even uh, smaller ones like uh, cormorants that may, on the East Coast, they, they were essentially figured that uh, double-crested cormorants were gonna go extinct, but they have five young. So in order to maintain a population, and they live 20 years, or up to 20 years, essentially to replace yourself in a population, you only need to get one young through a, um, you know, through a 10-year period or something. So there's lots of birds, like in the Bering Sea, uh, the kitty wakes, that can fail year after year after year. But then they get a good year, and you get a couple of young off. And, you know, you can replace yourself if you don't have too many other things. So there are a lot of boom and busts of birds. Uh, El Nino's in the South Pacific. You can go to those islands, and, you know, you'll have tens of thousands of birds, but they'll be young sitting around that have no food, and they eventually just starve. And, um, so boom and bust is a common thing among birds. Just when they wash up on our shores, we tend to notice it a lot more. But there's a lot more of these warming events. So the adaptation that nature can make is good. It's fluid. And with these extra pressures coming down from human impact, that might be waning that ability to survive and replace and reproduce with all the pressures that the ocean is under. Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully we've mit or we're able to somewhat mitigate by doing these things, getting rid of fisheries that are killing birds or habitat problems uh, right. and getting rid of predators right. that we can make the species more resilient to those effects. Yeah. So how can we get kelp back? And we don't really have a kelp her. person up here, but I, it is a problem. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, the Japanese factory kelp, uh, kelp harvesters were off the boat here. Uh, they thought it was a good idea because the fish were hiding in the kelp. And so the fishermen thought, well, if we get rid of the kelp, the fish will be easy to get, right? So it's <laughs> not a systematic thing. That was, that was pretty severe, and I think that set this kind of oscillation of, because what happened when that occurred, the, um, uh, the otters just started disappearing, the sea urchins came out, I mean, it just would start these oscillations of various types of systematic intersections. And, you know, what's happening now, we had that starfish wasting disease that happened a couple of years ago. I mean, we have these oscillations, which a lot of them are, are probably significantly exacerbated by human agency, or the stresses that we put on the system. What's happened with the kelp specifically right now, it's not really my specialty, my, but my suspicions are, uh, no, to answer your questions, in terms of uh, kelp uh, permaculture, I mean, I think it's a good idea. It's the one way that we might be able to, to help kind of cushion the system a little bit. Um, it'll, it remains to be seen what, uh, what other kind of uh, ancillary impacts that that has, whether they're good or bad, and just hope for the best. And we'll have Sheila Siemens here on our panel uh, bringing it home this afternoon and we know that she's got a lot of a lot more information on urchin barons and kelp and how that those two tie together so 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> Put your hands up. So take the take on wind turbines up and down so the I, coast. Uh, I spent about 10 years working on the turbines from the offshore stuff that we were doing and then each study that was done for proposed uh, uh, turbines up and down the east coast, I would either advise on them or help them design their bird surveys that they needed to do. Um, <clears throat> that's a whole hour talk <laughs> about the effects. I mentioned one is just one that they don't think about is putting them near oil or near channels. Um, but there's uh, lots of other effects, possibly the birds getting hit. The advantage is that as they get bigger and bigger, most of the birds are flying lower. Um, and as they get taller, to where the bottom of the turbine is two or three hundred feet up in the air, your less chance of getting the birds. But there's sound, there's vibrations, there's which we heard about last night. Um, there's electronic um, uh, transmission lines that set up electrical uh, fields in the water. There's the possible effects are enormous, but some of the beneficial effects of reducing our carbon input <laughs> may yeah. help outweigh that, you know. Yeah, that a little bit. So we do know that fossil fuel is killing the planet. That's that simple. And we're gonna have to look at the balance of harms. Uh, it is uh, a work in progress right now uh, in terms of understanding the impacts on birds and understanding the impacts of the sound on the animals inside the, the electromagnetic fields that are, are perhaps uh, disrupting the, the migrations of, of elasmobranchs. There's a lot of possibilities here, but we know that fossil fuel is killing us. But one of the things I'd like to reframe this power usage thing for all of us is that we tend to think that a solution will be to unplug everything from fossil fuel and plug it into sustainable. We actually have to look at using less energy. Right. So, great. Oh, Jen, you want to answer that, Scott? So we have time for one more question. Yeah. Howard's presentation and that any confusion to the politics of the standard rams. Uh, I know the Army Corps is, you know, their goal is to is all about flood control. And if they're the ones that are managing those dams, is that still what's being uh, the story that's still being sold is these are needed for flood control? For power generation, is that what you said? The Army Corps. Like the, it wasn't the Army Corps' original uh, Rationale. Yeah, was, was to control floods. Oh, floods? No. Oh, flood control. That is what you might term technically a lie. <laughs> they are not for flood control. They were designed specifically as what are called run of the river dams. That is one of the rationales that is, you know, sent out there all the time for keeping the dams flood control. No, uh, they can only operate with some flow constantly. So if they can't store water and function in any other way, so they are made to continually be circulating the water, they are not storage. So they are designed not to be flood control. That, yeah, it's used, but no, not true. Okay, I, I have to get this gentleman here. I kept skipping you, I'm sorry. Um, we've taken looks at various camera angles on various, what I would call symptoms almost. Could you comment briefly on more global, long-term, long-game strategies? Because it seems like we're, we're, we're basically playing whack-a-mole with the crises. Um, do you have any vision of long-term strategies? Anybody? Uh, a spiritual renewal. Uh, I, I think we need to to uh, reassess our whole relationship with with nature, our whole our whole sense of of family, of of you know 
co-survival that, that we depend on everything and we, you know, the, the plant people, the animal people, they are all our family. And we need to adopt that kind of reverence and gratitude for all of the life that is around us that sustains us. I think it's a, it's a very deep feeling that has been obliterated by industrial society for hundreds of years uh, that we need to renew within ourselves and I think then behavior will follow that will protect all that. All right. Um, sorry, we don't have any, uh, we don't have time for any more questions right now because we need to break for lunch. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, one more. Um, the State Department of Natural Resources has banned all non-native fish from being farmed. Uh, th there is a proposal to uh, farm sterilized trout, and that's uh, in abeyance right now, so we'll see how far that goes, but at least uh, that is being clamped down on. Oh, in Washington State, the, you know, all of Puget Sound. Anyway, we are going to break for lunch. We've got to get our presenters fed and fueled up for the rest of the afternoon. Please come back. We'll start around 1.30 or so. If you're not coming back, know that this evening from 6 to 8 at the Noyo Center for Marine Science, uh, they're building on Main Street. We're having a meet and greet.